Hello, I'm CJ and this is Music Monday. So today we're going to be talking about tempo. Tempo is how fast the song moves, how fast music moves. And tempo can be described in a lot of different ways. I see in my, um, my earlier students' books, it's usually described in English words and with some sort of descriptor. So play this, um, play like a robot or play brightly or pray, play briskly. Um, and so it uses English words. Um, however, when you get into more complex music, more Italian words tend to be used. And so um, we're going to talk a little bit. You can see here I've got all of these, all of my, uh, a bunch of um, flashcards that I use with my students here. Um, each one of these has a word on the front and then it has the definition of the word on the back. And I use these with my students uh, to just kind of work with uh, whether they know terms or not and help them learn terms. Often in music I see at the very beginning of the page when you look at that first page of music at the top left hand corner of the first staff, that first line of music. Sometimes you will see a little quarter note and then an equal sign and then it'll have a number and it'll either say BPM or it'll just have the number. That tells you how many beats per minute like a, a miles per hour kind of thing. Those That number says, okay, if it's a 70, that's a fairly slow pace, 70 beats per minute. A faster pace might be 125 beats per minute or 130 beats per minute. Um, so that's one way to indicate tempo. Another way is to use some of these words. Now, these are primarily Italian words. Um, in fact, I think all the ones I'm going to show you today are Italian. Um, and there's a couple of different types of uh, tempo words. Uh, there are the basic tempo words. It's a, it's a set tempo. It describes a speed. Then there are more descriptive tempo words. It's a simile, a like, or an as. And it usually says with something or like something when it's in its description, it's a descriptor. The third kind is what happens in the middle of the piece or further in the piece. It doesn't usually happen at the beginning. It gives you an idea of when the tempo changes within the piece, what happens and it's an indicator of tempo change within the piece. So we're gonna start with the very slowest tempo at the beginning. And the very, very slowest tempo is called Largo. And largo means very, very slowly. That's all it means. It's just very slowly. Slightly less slow is lento. And then we have adagio. We're going to put these in order. And then we have andante. Andante actually means a walking tempo. So it's very similar to the... Um, the more descriptive tones and that it is a walking tempo, but it is very common to see it andante, a walking tempo. It's faster than adagio, it's faster than largo or lento, it's just a really moderate pace. Um, you will also see what's called moderato, which moderato means a moderate tempo, which might be andante, it might be a little faster than andante, but it's a, uh, it's a moderate tempo, a middle road of the tempo. So we've got slow and then we've got moderate. The next thing we have um, are two slightly faster tempos. One is allegro, which means quick and lively. And the other one is allegretto, which basically means a little allegro. So it's still pretty quick and lively, but it's slower than allegro. The next two we see are vivo and vivace, or vivace. Um, I'm not really sure how other people pronounce it, but I have always pronounced it vivace. Um, so this means lively. This means lively as well, but it's also brisk and bright. So this may have more slurs or more connected notes in it, whereas you may hear more staccato or separated notes in this tempo depends on the piece of music, but this one is definitively faster than Vivo.
The last two tempo markings at the beginning are presto, which means fast, and then prestissimo. And prestissimo is actually faster than presto. Unlike allegretto and allegro, um, this one is actually faster than this one. This is actually the fastest tempo that you can make. Um, it'll make your fingers fall off eventually. No, I'm kidding. That's a joke. Um, but those are the basic at the beginning tempos. Um, and they just, they're marked at the beginning, usually at the very top on the left hand side, right above the uh, time signature, key signature. Um, and it gives you a sense of how it starts. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about the descriptor tempos. And the descriptor tempos, like I said before, are like metaphor tempos or simile tempos. It means like or as, or it might describe something. It's a descriptor. So it has everything from con moto, which means with motion. So this would mean it would be moving along. This might be um, put together with something like, pulling out another one here with Allegro. So you might see this at the very top. This would probably be more in the middle of the staff between the two, between the bass clef and the, and the treble clef. You would see this in the middle and it's just a descriptor of how to play those notes. Um, with movement, you want to move them forward. It's an expressive tempo. Um, then, as long as we're talking about expressive, we have expressivo, which means with feeling, play with feeling. You see a lot of this in Beethoven because Beethoven was very much about emotion and excitement and drama. I mean, king of drama, really, in terms of music. You have, then you have terms like a la marcia, which means like a march. So you might see this in a march. <laughs> so that's something that's very common in marches, obviously. Um, and then animato, which means spirited or with energy or animated, which would be excited. And, and you will see this again, like the con moto, you might see it in between. It would be a tempo marking that wouldn't necessarily be at the beginning. It might be somewhere in the middle. And it just gives you a little bit of an extra emphasis on what the tone is supposed to be, what the tempo is supposed to be for those particular, that particular area. It might be that theme within the music. We'll talk about themes another day. Um, it might be um, that section of the music uh, just asks for some animoto. It asks for some animation. Um, I see this one a lot, cantible, which means singing. Um, often this is indicated when you have single notes or maybe um, you're only playing two notes at a time and they're played in a singing manner. Uh, meaning they flow together like a singer, a singer's voice. You also have dolce, which means sweetly, grazioso, which means gracefully. My two personal favorite are the two last we're going to talk about in this section, and that is giocoso, which means humorously, and scherzado, which means playfully. And the thing I like about these two terms and, and seeing these in music is that so often, particularly in classical music, there is a tendency for us to think of it as a very serious prospect that playing classical music is just very serious, serious undertaking. And it's just very, very focused. It's not humorous or funny at all. But when you play music, um, often there's a great deal of humor in music. Uh, there are many songs that I've played, both classical and modern, that have really a real playful or a real humorous bent. And so I think that um, those two are just really, it's always fun to see them in music. So the last set we're going to talk about is this, um, these terms are tempo terms, but they often happen within the music, not necessarily at the beginning. Um, many of them indicate a change of tempo within the music. So we're going to talk a little bit about what each one of them would do to music. The first one we're going to talk about is accelerando. And if you are um, into etymology at all, and etymology. If you're into the study of words, I never remember which one's the study of words and the study of bugs. Entomology, I think, is the study of bugs. Etymology is the study of words, I think. Don't quote me on that. 
Um, so if you're into the, the study of words, accelerate comes from the root, the same root as this word. And it means to become faster or to get faster, to accelerate. Um, you may see this after a, um, a section that is very, very slow. The beginning of the piece might be largo or lento, where it's a, a very, very slow tempo. And then all of a sudden in the middle, there would be an accelerando. And so you would be asked to speed up the next section. Um, this one, uh, actually the next couple. So we have meno, molto, piu, and poco. Um, but these are uh, number words. So this is meno is less, molto is much, pio, piu, piu is more, and poco is a little bit. Um, and these are usually combined with another term of some kind. So you might see these two words together, poco shizando, a little bit playfully. So the tone is going to be a little bit playfully. Or you might see um, meno komoto with less motion. You might see this after a section that has a lot of motion. This would have less. Um, you might see these two together. Piu gracioso, more gracefully. And just the idea that you would combine them with other tempo terms to give a little bit more in-depth idea of what you're gonna do. Then we come to my two favorite um, additional terms. The first one, now this one can be used either at the beginning of the piece, I've seen it at the beginning of the piece. It's also often used at the end of the piece to really make an emphasis at the end of the piece. You often hear it in marches at the end, the last refrain of the march. Um, I know that in pomp and circumstance in, uh, in the, the graduation song, if you're not familiar with pomp and circumstance as a title, the graduation song, um, there's a section at the very end of the song when they're playing the, the main theme again at the very end where they play it maestoso. And maestoso means majestically. And it's one of my absolute favorite terms I've ever seen in any kind of piece of music. Um, it just brings to mind a, a majesty, um, that whole idea of grace and gravitas and, and big finish at the end. And I really, that's one of the reasons I really like this term. And then the last term that we're going to talk about in this section is called a tempo. And a tempo is what you will find if you start off at the very beginning with largo. And then a few measures in, you accelerando. And you might accelerando to allegro. And then in the next section, it decides it wants you to go back to largo. They're not going to put largo again. They're going to put a tempo, which means return to the original speed. And so the idea that you have this sort of out bar where you can pull like on a bus, you're on a bus and you pull the little lever, the bus stops. A tempo is like that. It stops whatever's happening at the moment and it returns to the beginning. So that's a little bit about tempo. So now that we've reached the end of our video, we're going to talk a little bit about a piece of music that I really like. Um, so we're going to talk about Beethoven's Piano Sonata in C minor, opus 27, number two. Um, Beethoven himself subtitled the work Sonata Quasi Una Fantasia. And I have horrible pronunciation in Italian because all the Italian I've learned has been in music. So my apologies to anyone who speaks Italian and realizes I just completely murdered it. Um, you, however, probably know this song already, but you know it by the name Moonlight Sonata. And it was given that piece because there was a critic who said that it reminded him of a boat passing the wild scenery of Lake Lucerne in the moonlight. And so it became known as the Moonlight Sonata. 
This sonata was written in 1801. A sonata is a particular kind of piano music. It describes the structure of the music, um, which we'll talk, a bit, talk about a little bit more in a little bit, but I just want to give you a little history on this. So it's believed that the sonata was inspired by Beethoven's 17-year-old pupil, whose name I'm going to have to read here, the Countess Giulietta Giocciardi. I think. And again, my apologies to the Italian speaking community of the world. Um, so the work is actually dedicated to her. Um, so obviously there's some evidence for it being inspired by her. Um, Beethoven, like Chopin's Nocturne, Beethoven actually considered this sonata to be really inferior to a lot of his other pieces. Um, although it is quite a popular piece. I enjoy playing it for the simple fact that most of the melody in this piece happens in the left hand, which is fairly rare. Most of the time in a sonata in particular, the melody happens in the right hand. Uh, I actually learned how to play the Moonlight Sonata when I was in high school. Um, but one of the things that I really enjoy, and this is true of the Nocturne, Chopin's Nocturne in E minor as well, um, once you learn a song, it doesn't mean you're done with it. Um, over the years, I've played both of these pieces many, many times, and each time I find just a little bit, something just a little bit different to do with the song, maybe a, a place in the song that I've never quite gotten quite right the way I want to play it. And so the interpretation develops as you get older and as you become more experienced in music. And so um, both of these songs, the one I've talked about last week, as well as this one, um, are very uh, influential in my life. So a sonata is actually a form of music or a structure of music. In this case, the Moonlight Sonata is a very distinct setup. It has three parts, the exposition, a development, and a recapitulation. The exposition is the first thought or idea in the music. The development takes that idea and expands it a little, adds some new things to it. And the recapitulation returns to the original idea and works that through to the end. Now, a sonata being that type of music, think of it like a sonnet or a limerick or a haiku in poetry. It has to obey certain rules and the rules within that are very specific. It rests in a standard definition and a series of hypotheses about the underlying reasons for the durability and variety of the form. And that is from Wikipedia, which I think is so very dry and boring. So we're going to show you just a little bit of an explanation of how this works. In the Moonlight Sonata, you start out with the exposition. And you may recognize this with a the beginning where it starts out like this. up note in there and my piano is severely out of tune but you get the idea this is the beginning of the piece it's the first idea you hear in a piece and you're going to hear that throughout the piece but it's going to be worked in in different ways you get a little bit further in and you're going to hear a very similar style as we move along in the center section which is actually we're going to move over here um the center section comes in and it starts to add a little bit on that idea in the right hand as well as the left hand. And you hear that again. You also hear this start to come in. development on the original idea. 
When you get to the end of the song, or at least the end of the first movement, you return back to the original idea, and that takes you all the way through to the end. So we go back to this, where the melody is actually both in the left hand and the right hand. You've got this beautiful harmonic going on. And here's that middle part that's worked in. And it goes on to the end through that um, recapitulation or redevelopment of that first idea. So um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about as long as we're talking about tempo, the uh, Moonlight Sonata it does actually start in what's called Adagio Sostenuto. And Adagio Sostenuto is very slow and sustained. And then it does have the beats per minute, which is 52 beats per minute, which is quite slow. That's it for Music Monday. I hope you had a wonderful time with me. I know I did. Um, Please, if you did enjoy this video, like it below, subscribe if you want to see more videos. I will see you guys next Monday. Have a great week.